So let's do a little questions and answers about solar roadways. Let's just remind ourselves what this project is. It's technology that replaces all roadways, parking lots, sidewalks, driveways, tarmacs, bike paths, and outdoor recreation surfaces with solar panels. And not just lifeless, boring solar panels, smart microprocessing interlocking hexagonal solar units. And thus far, it's raised almost $2 million on Indiegogo. Guy Hafication asks, can someone with a brain and spare time do a basic calculation as to how much power the US would need just to keep the LEDs on during the night. Remember, all the markings are from the LEDs. Every panel has a series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. So during the night, how many power stations need to come on? Also remember, there isn't any storage facility for all of the power you generate during the day so you can't run them all off solar panels. Well, guy application, I would love to do those calculations. So let's say these panels are about a half a meter by half a meter. That's about a quarter of a meter squared. So it takes about four of them to give you one square meter of road surface. You will recall that the target of this project was to pave all of the blacktop surfaces in America with these tiles. There's 25,000 square miles of road surfaces, parking lots and driveways in the lower 48 states. If we covered that with solar panels, just a 15% efficiency, we produce three times more electricity than this country uses on an annual basis. 25,000 square miles, or 60 billion square meters. That's about 240 billion tiles. That's about 1,000 tiles for each of the 300 million Americans in the US. Now, each one of those tiles has about 50 LEDs in it, which means there's about 12 trillion multicolored LEDs now just in the road surface alone, or 50,000 LEDs for each of the 300 or so million people in America. Now, a string of, say, 300 bright multicolored LEDs will cost about $20 and runs on about 60 watts. That gives just the cost of purchasing the LEDs at about $800 billion. That means that the bill for just the LEDs would cost every single man, woman, and child in America about $2,500. So what sort of energy bill would you be looking at for just turning on those 12 trillion LEDs? Well, 300 of them run at about 60 watts. So to run 300 of them for an hour would basically cost bugger all. However, to run all 12 trillion of them for one hour would cost about $168 million. Or $4 billion per day. Or $1.4 trillion per year. That's about $5,000 per American. And that's just the electricity bill. And yes, that is about five times what your average American pays for electricity at the moment. Or to look at it another way, even if you were to only have these lights on for 20% of the time, you would still double the power consumption of your typical American. This is exactly the kind of over-the-horizon thinking that has brought Idaho's own solar roadways to national and world prominence. Plus, LEDs only have a few years life expectancy, and that's when they're not in an environment where they're being permanently shaken by trucks rolling over them and so on, or being exposed to hard sunlight. However, thanks to the genius idea of incorporating the lights actually into the road service, this means that now, whenever you want to just change the bulbs, you have to stop using the road. We can all benefit from this public-private partnership, which will create jobs and lessen our dependence on fossil fuels. And at that point, you've just got to be kind of honest that eh, maybe there is actually some sense, after all, in putting the lights above the road. There's no problem in having your head in the clouds as long as your feet are on the ground. And that's pretty much why I'm critical of these ideas. I mean, let's just take, for instance, the use of glass as a road surface. So Jeremy Smith writes, You think you're so smart, Mr. Thunderfoot. Why don't you actually test your speculations and contribute to the development? You're speculating against some very advanced science. Did you ever go to college? Good luck with that. 
Well, tests are a good idea, but we'll come back to those in a moment. But actually, no, this is actually very far from advanced science in that glass is fundamentally a pretty soft material. I mean, you can just look it up on the Moore scale and there it is right bang in the middle, softer than most rocks, you know, the aggregate that we usually grind up to make our road surfaces from. And that means that if you grind rocks against glass under the wheels of say a tractor trailer, then what you're gonna end up with is ground glass. And that's what makes glass an unsuitable material for building roads from. So far from being very advanced science, this is actually some of the simplest. And then of course, there's all the health issues that you're likely to get by exposing the entire nation to ground up glass dust on the road. Ryan Summel of Sky writes, they need the money to learn about these issues. That's what Indiegogo and other funding is giving the company the ability to do actual research and make these ideas into a reality. Absolutely. And as the father of modern rocketry said, one good test result is worth a thousand expert opinions. Sure, testing is very important, but I don't think I'm going to need quite a million dollars to work out this is a very bad idea. So let's get a research and development clock going in one corner, shall we? Every panel has a series of LED lights on the circuit board that can be programmed to make landscape designs, warning signs, parking lot configurations, whatever. To work out that LEDs with this spacing won't be able to give you road markings in the day, you need to buy a bright LED strip costing, say, $20 and a nice sunny day. Cost nothing. So here I have some very bright LEDs which I can have in white, blue, green or red. And now I have them out in the sunlight for red, green, and blue, and white. So as you can see, once you get into the full light of day, it really isn't quite the same thing as doing it at night. A little bit of shade. There we go. Just about to see it now because we've got some uh, cloud. But as for having those to drive on, you've got to be kidding me. Now let's do some research on what's likely to happen when the glass road is subject to very minor wear. So first of all, I'm going to take a regular glass bottle. Cost nothing. Some random dirt off the road. Cost nothing. And now let's use a rubber ruler end to mimic a car tire. Cost one dollar. Well, 20 seconds later, what you find is that only 20 seconds of the most low pressure abrasion and this glass is actually pretty badly scratched up. But, but, but let's try it with something a little harder, shall we? Let's take a, a borosilicylate glass. Cost $10. The same test. And it's the same result. That's just a few seconds of scratching with borosilicate glass. Imagine what that's going to look like after 20 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what I would spend the remaining $1,999,969 of research and development money on. I also hope that this satisfies Jeremy about actually doing some tests. As he said, if you think you're so smart, Thunderfoot, why don't you actually test your speculations and contribute to the development? You're speculating about some very advanced science here. Did you ever go to college? Good luck with that. Like This is not the sort of research that you need a million dollars of R&D money to do. Nor is this the sort of thing that you would need a, a PhD in 20 years of research experience to do. Indeed, this is more the sort of study you would expect to see at, say, a high school science fair. Leslie Graham writes, 
and the desperate fight back from the doomed carbon corporations and their duped shills begins. What a pathetic video. Just desperate Luddite nonsense from start to finish. Solar is a no-brainer. More solar energy hits the US in one hour than we generate in a year. This is one way we can begin to harvest limitless free power. The problems will be ironed out. Same as with any other invention that won't work. Like the horseless carriage, for example. Well, Leslie, you see, this is sort of the problem. The material is fundamentally unsuitable for its purpose. It's kind of like trying to build a skyscraper out of, say, chocolate in the desert, in the summer, and on a foundation of jello. The unsuitability of the material for the purpose is kind of a deal breaker. You know, chocolate skyscrapers, Led Zeppelins, glass roads, and so on. These really aren't bugs you can work out of the system, because the bug is intrinsically related to the properties of the material. Nor does pointing out that Led Zeppelins will never work make you a shill for the hot air balloon industry. So what exactly is stopping us from doing this? Geometry. Just ignore it. Yes, and other fun factors like geometry. Look, let's just say that a solar panel that tracks the sun has a 100% efficiency for comparison. Now, if you don't track the sun, you just have a fixed solar panel, then you lose about half of that potential. That is, your solar panel is now operating only at 50% relative efficiency. And if you light flat on the ground, as you would in say a road, you're now down to about 30% efficiency. By the simple act of geometrically laying these panels down flat on the ground, you are throwing away about 60%, two-thirds of their potential power-generating capability. Okay, so this is a really crude example. So I've got my solar cell checked up, hooked up to a multimeter and to an electrolysis cell. So basically, the more juice it produces, the more bubbles you're going to get here. So this is just an example of what it's like when the cell is flat. And what you'll see is, as I raise the angle up, the volts go up, and the number of bubbles go up, till we get to, you know, an angle which is basically pointing directly at the sun, which is when you get the most out of your solar panel. And if I lie it down again, what you'll find is you get nowhere near as much out of that. But then you can't actually coat the whole road with solar panels because they tend to be fragile. That is, you can't actually have the solar panel as a load-bearing component of the road. So this means that you need to create a cavity within the panel which means that the rest that is in that cavity must support the whole weight of the road and the forces of the traffic on it. Which of course means that that material has to be much stronger. So with the sake of argument, you only have half of the road coated with solar panels. That means that the supports that you're going to put in there to carry the whole weight of the road and the forces of the vehicle on it must be twice as strong. Or if you're going to put three quarters of it covered with solar panels, then you would need the pillars to hold up the road four times as strong as the regular road surface and so on. That is, optimistically, you are probably looking at solar panels under the road being about one fifth as efficient as those that you would just put by the roadside. Or looked at another way, the efficiency of one tracking solar panel by the roadside is probably worth about five under the road. Plus it didn't cost you the arm and the leg of actually coating the road in a material that is fundamentally unsuitable for driving on. So this is about the same size as the tiles in the glass roads project, apart from of course this is almost 100% coated with solar panels whereas the roads are only about 30% coated with solar panels. So this is three times more effective already, and this is only a 40 watt module. Now, you'll recall that to power 300 LEDs, which is maybe enough to do 
six tiles or something um, takes 60 watts. So if this were pointing at the sun the whole time, maximum power out output of 40 watts, it's maybe enough to do four tiles. Right? Um, but of course, it can only do that during the day. So during the night, uh, if you want to power them day and night, you would only be able to power two um, panels worth of LEDs if they were pointing at the sun the whole time. And of course you've got to factor that they're not pointing at the sun the whole time, they're lying flat on the ground, which loses about, probably about two-thirds of your efficiency. And that's assuming that there's not glass or something else over the top of this, like a parked car for instance. Um, so realistically, if you could coat the roads with solar panels like this, they would maybe have enough power to uh, power a few LEDs all of the time. So the idea that you would use these for road markings is it's simply a non-starter. Mr. Jedi Kyle says the Wright Brothers critics were hugely skeptical of them too. Well, for that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to refer you to Carl Sagan, who said that the fact that some geniuses were laughed at does not imply that all those who are laughed at are geniuses. They laughed at Columbus. They laughed at Fulton. They laughed at the Wright brothers. But they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. The real question isn't who is critical of them or if anyone laughs at them. The question is, is can you tell the difference between, say, the Wright brothers and Bozo the Clown? But the Wright brothers seem to be a sort of common theme with people defending this. And in some cases, even going on to say that, you know, we know how to make hard glass materials, like the ones they make cell phones out of, like, for instance, sapphire. Well, coating roads with sapphire, basically a crystal of aluminium oxide, who would indeed make them very scratch resistant, as it's one of the hardest materials around. Sure, they might cost a hundred times what it would cost to coat them with glass, but we'll worry about that later. However, one single broken panel might have some rather unhappy consequences. Look, you can get an idea of what will happen when a chipped fragment of a sapphire road hits a windscreen can be gotten by simply throwing a fragment of a spark plug, which is also made up of this very hard aluminium oxide, at a car window. How? Because side windows are made of tempered glass. This makes it very hard and very resistant to blunt objects. But when you fracture porcelain, it creates a very, very fine, very hard point. Yeah, that's why they're called ninja rocks. And ignoring the fact that coating the roads with sapphire would cost a hundred times more than tempered glass. I'm not so sure that a road made out of sapphire will answer all of your problems either. Or for that matter, just imagine the damage that a single shattered spark plug could do on a glass road. A Dakar 